Um, so yeah, hi everybody. I am Matthew Miller. I am the Fedora project leader, which is kind of a weird title for a project like this because it is not the kind of thing where I say, here's what we'll do, and then everybody does it. It's the kind of thing where I try and talk to everybody who's in this room and not in this room and everybody who works on Fedora and try to figure out what we're all collectively interested in and working on and try and sort of establish a coherence so we can all work together and better get to where we actually want to go. Um, I've been doing these State of Fedora talks for a little while now. You've probably seen one before. I usually have some graphs and things in them. I've got graphs in this one as well. Um, I also am going to try and do something dangerous, which is make a point with some of the things I see in those graphs. So we'll, we'll see how that goes this time. Um, and does the clicker work? It does when I turn it on. Okay. If I want to laser pointer, that's the one to laser pointer. Okay, uh, so first, um, the last couple of releases, Fedora 25, 26, have gotten really good press and a good, good uptake. A lot of people saying good things about them. So I like to take a moment to show these quotes, which I will not read because they're written down, uh, but they're nice. And I would like to congratulate everybody who worked on these releases. Um, that's basically everybody in this room, I think, uh, and lots of people, again, not in this room. Uh, congratulations, good job, these awesome releases, the last few releases, yes. Uh -huh. So I was also looking back at press from you know, previous years to see like what people said sort of five years or so ago, and uh, some of the things back then were so mean that I decided not to put those quotes up on the board, and instead here is a uh, pretty version picture of the eclipse from NASA public domain, so that's down there. Um, yeah, uh, we've done really well in the recent few years, but it's not necessarily the natural state of Fedora that everything is awesome. Like, it's a lot of hard work to make an awesome Fedora release, and we've done a really good job of it recently. Um, but we've had some times where Fedora has struggled a little bit more. So it's good to remember those things as well as we congratulate ourselves. Um, but back to congratulating for a little bit here. This is uh, mirror statistics. Uh, from the most couple, recent couple of releases. Basically, um, a number of times, or a number of IP addresses every day that we see connecting to our mirror servers. There's a whole bunch of caveats with this, but that's basically, uh, we feel like it's pretty good for comparing release to release, even if the um, access numbers are maybe not tele uh, completely representative. Um, but we can see, basically, we've had pretty good growth since Fedora 20 each time, uh, maybe a little bit dipped to 24. Fedora 25, very high on the charts, and Fedora 26 um, just coming up, and actually this is a seven day moving average. Um, if I look at the raw numbers, you can see that Fedora 26 has actually crossed Fedora 25, so it's now our uh, highest uh, peak release right now, so um, that's pretty cool too. We have had um, very fast uptake. Um, I think it took uh, 40 days for that to happen from the release, which is uh, a new record for people coming to the new Fedora. So. Um, Again, awesome, good for us. Um, this is my dinosaur picture. Um, because these mirror statistics, I um, promised Smooge, who helps me gather these, that I would um, present them in the context of dinosaurs. Um, it's dangerous to draw too many conclusions from these because uh, there's very sensitive to network kind of things. We don't do any invasive tracking of Fedora. There's no ID tracking. There's no per machine tracking. So we're just seeing machines hitting the mirrors, and there's a lot of reasons they wouldn't show up. Um, machines behind NAT, if there's five machines behind one, in, uh, one gateway, that's counted as one. If there's a thousand machines, it's counted as one. On the other hand, if you move around to like 20 coffee shops in a day, you might be counted as 20, as long as you do an update at each one of those coffee shops. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. Um, some of us definitely do. Uh, so yeah, the, um, dinosaurs are involved in these statistics. So um, there, there's that to uh, consider when taking too much from this data. Um, all right, so things are generally pretty good in Fedora right now. Very popular, uh, releases are solid, I'm very proud of them, I'm proud of everybody. Um, meanwhile, on, on Devel list, uh, we have this quote, uh, feels like everything is on fire and not in a good way. Um, you can go, go look who said that if you want, but um, it wasn't just one person. There's kind of a general feeling that 
things are kind of crazy. So if everything is so good, uh, right now we're in the midst of having a cycle where uh, we decided to stick to the schedule of having releases in October, even though the last release was in July, which means we've got like three months to put together a whole release, which seems kind of crazy. Uh, it is kind of crazy. And not only that, um, in order to make that happen, there's basically only one good way, which is to say we're going to defer some of the things we wanted to do to the next release. We're not going to try and cram everything in, um, which makes sense. Then the things that we are trying to do on this release are big, crazy, lighting things on fire, destructive things. So why are we doing these big, crazy things this time around uh, rather than saying, OK, this is a short release. Now it's time to be conservative. Um, I've, uh, hopefully some of these dinosaur numbers will help um, think about why we're doing that. Um, I strongly believe, and I think that a lot of the people in this room feel like the things we're doing are important right now, and I think um, this flock will uh, hopefully feel like we can bring everybody who's feeling uncomfortable on Devel List into consensus on that so we feel like we're doing the right thing here. Um, so this is back to more dinosaur numbers here. And this is basically um, from uh, all time when we have statistics here. And I've kind of lumped them into random groups here, uh, just sort of some of the groups, the, the releases lumped together, basically arbitrarily as I kind of felt they fit, fit together. Um, the red here, which is actually colored red by coincidence, but um, is a perfectly good time because you can see that's when uh, things started going downhill there a little bit, where, we, where um, the numbers you know, instead of going up like they had been, suddenly are going the wrong direction. Um, and this was a time of a lot of change for Fedora. Um, the system D in the distribution, uh, GNOME 3 came out, there's an Anaconda rewrite, um, DNF's probably in there somewhere. So these are things that were pretty scary at the time. Um, but I think that um, as we got to the Fedora Next thing, which is this green area here, those are some of the foundational things that made it possible for Fedora to be as awesome as it is today. So um, there was that time of decrease, but um, then we had this gigantic growth coming up. So I think that was generally good. It would be nice um, this time when we're lighting things on fire if we can do it and keep growing at the same time. Um, but sometimes you know, things don't naturally just always go up. Uh, and so uh, one of the things I really want to point out, wait, the laser pointer is supposed to go on this screen way over here. Um, so does it show? Yeah. Uh, we've got this growth going up here. This little dip is kind of a weird anomaly. Um, this seems to be a lot of Fedora 21 and Fedora 22 systems that were 32-bit, that um, instead of upgrading to the next release, they just went away. We don't know why. Um, it may coincide with a lot of our chatter about, um, you know, we're not quite able to support 32-bit on Intel very much anymore. So maybe some people were like, okay, we're going to switch to CentOS or RHEL or something else for those systems. Don't really know. Again, we just have observational data. Um, it could be that all those systems just finally died. And so who knows? Uh, they're gone. Um, <laughs> and then things do you know, keep going up from there. But if we look for basic, oh, that's going ahead. Uh, for basically this last year here, it's actually pretty flat. It's neither growth nor decline. And um, that's kind of concerning to me because this um, we should be seeing growth. And you can see in the last bit here, um, which is basically since the Fedora 26 release, there's higher numbers. But you can also see on the very end of the chart, that's actually kind of back down, that higher numbers might just be noise. And this is one of, uh, can be one of the dinosaur artifacts, which is if you have a network which has Fedora 24, or Fedora 25 and Fedora 26 machines on it, if it's all Fedora 25 machines, that gets counted one time because of the, the NAT problem. If you suddenly have a Fedora 25 and 26 machine on there, now it's counted twice. So that can cause the data to be higher than it is. So I hope this is not true. I hope it's going to keep going up. I hope you know, maybe at least it's a new level. Um, but I would not be surprised to see this come back down to be flat for a while there. So um, that's a little bit concerning because um, I don't want our growth to slow down. Uh, and so here is another, another look at this data, um, sort of a way to corroborate uh, what's going on with that. Uh, this is looking at a completely different thing that we have some metrics on, uh, which is hotspot check-ins, which basically um, my laptop, a lot of your laptops, uh, every five minutes do a little check to make sure that they're not behind a captive portal where you're at the coffee shop or the hotel and it makes you log in. So it's the thing that makes it pop up, that convenient that thing that says, you're not on the real internet, you need to log in. Um, this is a pretty common thing that 
basically every operating system does this way, does these days. Ours does this by hitting a specific URL on the Fedora servers. So we're just counting the number of times people uh, hit that server there. Um, and again, you know, it's not invasive tracking. It's just we can see that there are machines hitting this uh, this URL. Uh, but Unlike the other one where it's once per day, this is every five minutes. So we're actually counting the average number, of, average per day of five minutes here. So you can see it's about 90,000 systems every, uh, every day. And so we can say, you know, that, like the, fi the average five minutes. So if we could basically say, let's say um, laptops are on a third of the day, eight hours a day, um, we can maybe assume that the actual total number is something more like 300,000, something like that. Um, which is okay, um, and not every machine is counted. Obviously, servers don't do this. Um, both uh, GNOME and KDE use this feature. I don't think any of our other desktop environments do. Um, some people, of course, may have turned it off or changed it to hit another server. So I wouldn't say that 300,000 is the total number of Fedora machines out there. Um, on the other hand, it's probably somewhere in that ballpark, maybe half a million Fedora systems. Uh, which is really, I think, a lower number than we'd like to have in this world. Um, there's a Stack Exchange has a survey of developers. Um, Stack Exchange is a gigantic uh, website that's very, very popular among software developers, and they did a survey of um, like 50 or 60,000 people every year, which is, um, you know, it's a web-based survey, not necessarily scientific. But anyways, uh, about 20% of those uh, developers are using Linux as their main desktop environment. Um, if we say that, that means 20% of developers in the world are using Linux. Um, that should be a lot more than half a million people in software developers alone, not, uh, not even worrying about all the other people who not, are not software developers who are using Linux on their desktop. So um, basically, I think that uh, although we're doing fairly well, and uh, we've reached a plateau, and we really should be growing a lot more in order to have the impact that we'd like to have in the world. So. Um, that's kind of why I'm talking about lighting things on fire a little bit, because fire is what propels growth. Um, so, switching graphs a little bit. How many people have seen a curve like this before? Uh, this way, over this way, I'm not on the screen. Okay, yeah, good, um, about half the room maybe. This is the diffusion of innovation curve, um, and this particularly uh, has a chasm in it. The first time I saw this was actually at FUDCON 2005, where Michael Tiemann stood up in front of us at Boston and talked about this. Uh, basically, this is the idea of um, when you have got a new idea, how it reaches the marketplace. And so we've got basically about 2.5% um, of the market are over in this innovators area, and maybe 12% uh, total in the innovators and early adopters section here. Um, and then the late majority, like that's when people are like, okay, this Linux stuff is really catching on. Um, and then eventually, you know, down there. So um, this stuff, the, the early majority, late majority, and all that, like, this is what enterprise distributions are for. People who are in that area need long-term support and not just long-term maintenance, something like um, distributions like uh, that, that um, have a lifetime for three years but don't necessarily give you full support, don't necessarily uh, cover what people need. So this is something that, uh, Fedora as a community, like that, that big area is probably off limits to us because we don't have the resources to cross that chasm. Um, that doesn't mean that we don't want to um, succeed, but uh, as part of our charter of fast moving and innovation, basically uh, we live in this space here, this uh, innovators and early adopters space. And one of the things I really like to push because it's something I've heard from a lot of people here in this community is that Fedora isn't just the bleeding edge. Like we often hear bleeding edge and I kind of would like to cross that off of things we say about Fedora. The bleeding edge is right up here and it's only a few people and things don't work very well. Fedora really wants, we wanna cover some of that but we don't wanna be in this early space where there are people who are actually using it because we wanna have an impact on real people's lives and we wanna make sure that technology gets tested and used and actually is doing things for people. It isn't just the bleeding. We want to be in the leading area, but not uh, completely bleeding. And we also would like to you know, uh, go as far that way into uh, making uh, a larger market as we possibly can, given the limitations of basically being fast moving and having limited resources in doing what we are. Uh, so the thing about this is that this leading edge doesn't just sit there. We can't just say, okay, we've invented Fedora, and now 14 years later, we're doing the same thing. 
uh, there are a lot of pressures on this from both sides. Basically, uh, pushing in from, from that bleeding edge, we have things like CoreOS, doing containerized operating systems, and even crazier things like Rancher OS, which runs the whole operating system in a container. Uh, we have you know, things like Raspbian, that are basically all the IoT innovations happening on a, a different platform from Fedora. Uh, on the desktop, there's uh, Solus, which is a very popular enthusiast desktop. There's Arch, which really does try to stay on the bleeding edge. Uh, Arch people are awesome. Their documentation is wonderful. Um, there's a lot of change going on in how desktops are put together right now. We've got Flatpak and Snappy and Flathub and all of those things, and those are pushing the innovation curve on things that uh, we need to keep up with. Uh, but that's not the only direction that that uh, change is coming from. So coming in sort of from the uh, early adopter side, and the other side, uh, traditionally, uh, we've been able to, in Fedora to rely on the fact that a lot of people will use Fedora because our downstreams are too slow. People who are using RHEL can't get the latest stuff, so they finally say, okay, well, I'm gonna make the trade-off, I'll go bleeding edge and take Fedora stuff because I know it's newer. Even if it doesn't give me all the things I need, I just need that newer kernel, I need that newer GCC, I need all those things. Um, but um, Red Hat has uh, tried to solve that problem for their customers because they need that with you know, things like software collections, which are basically meant to bring newer things into, Fedora, into, into RHEL. Uh, so we don't necessarily get for free, just, that just because we have newer things, people consider us to be innovative. So we need to do something a little different than just say, okay, we package stuff faster. Um, and uh, again, along those lines, in um, RHEL 7.4, that has an updated version of GNOME. So a lot of people are like, well, I could never run CentOS on my desktop. I'd never run RHEL on my desktop because the desktop environment is just so ancient and crufty. Uh, that's not gonna necessarily be the case anymore. So we can't necessarily rely on, we just have the latest things again. Um, so. Basically, um, it feels like we've got this big machine that is Fedora that puts things together. Uh, and you know we work on this crunch kind of cycle to try and put the Fedora together, and we have this idea of we've got this big machine of Fedora that we're working on, um, and so we have to figure out how are we gonna get past this flattening, how are we gonna make sure that Fedora stays relevant, how we can stay in that early adopter innovation niche, and how we can scale all of that up, and because taking machines and just making the machines we have bigger and bigger, um, is basically not gonna get us there because it can scale to a certain amount, but uh, just as we get bigger and bigger, we've got you know whatever, 17,000 packages in Fedora, and we're using infrastructure that was meant for you know thousands of packages and the lower ends of thousands, and so we have things where, like a Compose, basically putting together a release that can be tested from all the packages, takes 12, 14, 16 hours to do, uh, as long as everything goes right, and a lot because it's so, um, old and meant for things that meant for a smaller set of Fedora, uh, it often breaks. So um, this big machine is not really doing what we need anymore. Um, so um, basically what we need to do is set things on fire in a good way. We need, th this is for Steve Gallagher here, this slide. Uh, we, we need to um, make friends with the robots. Uh, not just because the graphic is cute, uh, but we really need to find a way to automate what we're doing in Fedora, and we need to make big, awesome changes that uh, will put us into where we need to be for the next decade of Fedora. Rather than, um, there are some things like um, someone on the develop list said, why are we doing all this blowing things up when we've got this basic things we need to do to make Rust packaging better? Now, doing better Rust packaging is awesome, um, but it is just baseline in the kind of things we need to do. We need to really focus on these big changes, and the Rust packaging can wait, because actually the Rust, people using Rust don't even care that we've packaged things. So uh, let's focus on stuff that has big robot size impact rather than the incremental changes, because it's not gonna get us very far. Um, so, uh, some of those things. We've got um, a couple initiatives that have a lot of talks here at this conference. Uh, one of them is Project Atomic, and specifically the Project Atomic Continuous Integration Initiative. So uh, continuous integration is a specific kind of testing where instead of doing validation testing, or in addition to validation testing, uh, you actually test every change as it's made in an environment that is like the production environment. 
Uh, so this is something we've never really done in Fedora. We do a lot of awesome QA and a lot of testing, and a lot of people here are deeply involved in that. But generally that testing happens either at the, like I made a package, okay, basic tests pass, kind of unit testing kind of things, or at the very end when we put all together, everything together, the big compose, the big compose comes out the end, and then people pick it up and start looking at it to see if it works. So the idea with continuous integration is whenever we make a change to a package, we automatically get an artifact at the end that gets run through robotic automatic testing and if your, your change would break something, you get told about it right away. And in fact, uh, we want to get to the point where your change is actually rejected. So if you submit something that now uh, Fedora doesn't boot anymore because of the thing you did, um, you can't do that thing. It will say, sorry, please fix this before it gets into Fedora. Um, so that's kind of exciting. And that, kind of, that level of automation behind that is what's going to let us get to the next level of things. Uh, so this is um, the way we produce Fedora uh, two-week atomic now, kind of. This is actually the plan I put together for that um, from people's ideas like two or three years ago now. Um, and you don't need to pay attention to what it actually says. The key thing is um, this was a bunch of new components that require a lot of manual work to happen. And this is actually working fairly well, although a lot of it relies on people actually manually pushing buttons, moving things around, and things like that, that it should be more automated than it is. And again, this only does validation testing. We run it through automated testing, but basically when it's done to see if it's okay to release, not at the development side. Um, so here's a new slide from Steph this morning, which I haven't had time to actually digest. But this is um, what we're, you should go to his talk on Thursday to learn what this actually means. This is basically where we're going with this. Uh, instead of having something that is bolted on the side, but actually integrated into the environment using the factory 2.0 stuff to actually, uh, and a new, uh, new pipeline to actually automatically test things as changes are made. And uh, I don't even know why there's a ghost on here, but it's awesome. Um, so that, uh, again, more automation and uh, producing things in a way that we haven't before that's gonna let us um, move this faster and scale up and uh, do a lot more things because uh, we're working together with the robots rather than fighting them. Um, so uh, modularity is another big thing, and this is what uh, I think may have tipped over the edge for the, um, the everything is on fire on Devel list. Modularity is basically an idea for uh, taking, uh, I, I kind of like to think of it as making the comps groups like super comps groups, basically selections of packages, uh, groups of packages, um, that you can install. It's not just install the web server, but you install the whole environment around the web server. Um, but with this, we can make those artifacts so they can install on different bases and move at different speeds. So we can say the web server comps group it has Apache 2.4, and that will install on whatever version of Fedora you want to run. It'll install on CentOS, it'll install on RHEL, and you can have that same version that'll build on a lot of different things. And um, this is, there's a lot of different documentation and pictures on modularity. I think this is one of the, one of the nicest ones. Basically, uh, again, with the automation theme, you have one module, and then that can be uh, made by robots to deploy in a lot of different environments. So you don't have to worry about, I'm gonna to need to make a container version of this, I need to make a flat pack version of this. We're working on infrastructure to automate that part of it and also to automate the testing of it so that when you make your changes, you can make your module and then people, users can deploy that module in a lot of different ways. So um, I think that's very cool. Uh, also related to that, um, this is another dinosaur graph. Um, this is uh, something that's important to stress about the impact of Fedora. So I was saying earlier something like, you know, um, half a billion people uh, using Fedora, something like that. Uh, that's not the limit of our impact. So this is um, the Fedora operating system, the blue line, and then uh, Apple, the extra packages for enterprise Linux, which is you know, Fedora stuff that we've taken and we've built it so that it'll run on RHEL and CentOS and scientific Linux and so on. Uh, about you know, five years ago, uh, that started exceeding the Fedora base operating system in popularity, and then, oh, that's, uh, has basically gone off the charts. I don't know what's happening at the top. We'll call those dinosaurs with that bump bouncing up there. But basically, this has uh, gone off the charts in growth and continues to go that way. So this is another area where Fedora, as a project, has a gigantic impact that is outsized from the people who are running Fedora as the base operating system. So this is one of the things where I think modularity has a 
big ability to make a lot more impact because right now these packages are done by a manual process where somebody says, okay, I'm going to decide to make my package available for Apple and then I'm going to commit to maintaining it for 10 years and all this kind of thing. And it's, uh, again, very popular, but it's kind of ragged and is not as great as it could be. I think with modularity, we have the ability to make packages available to this market that really, really wants them in a way that's a lot less work for us. We can offer them on different life cycles. We can say, yeah, you can run this on Apple, but I'm not promising to maintain this for 10 years because that's crazy. I'm a volunteer. I'm not going to maintain the same thing for 10 years. But I can you know, keep this up as I'm doing Fedora updates, and you can keep running it on your CentOS base so you can have the thing you want to move fast moving at the speed you want to move it at. Um, even if you have a stable base. And so that's a way that we, as Fedora, have a big impact um, beyond just um, the Fedora base operating system. Uh, and it's also really worth noting that uh, it's not just these extra packages that are impact from Fedora, but actually CentOS itself and RHEL itself comes from Fedora and comes from our work. So even if we have a small number of uh, individual users, our impact is outsized to that. So um, that is also something good and something to be proud of. Um, but I still think that we also want to keep growing the base Fedora as it is in order to um, really fulfill what our mission is. All right, uh, switching tack a little bit. Uh, this is a blog post I wrote a couple weeks ago or a week ago. Did anybody read this blog post? All right, like four people read this blog post. Thank you. I would like more people to read this blog post. Uh, so this isn't about making the operating system itself. This is about what we do as a community to um, bring the operating system to users. Uh, so we have an organization as part of Fedora called the Fedora Ambassadors. How many people here are Fedora Ambassadors? All right. A lot more people than read this post. Please go. Uh, I posted it to the Fedora Ambassadors mailing list, um, and it is on the community blog. Uh, basically, this is a proposal for what we should do with um, basically our strategy for spending Fedora money and our effort in, in the ambassadors to uh, basically show Fedora to the world. And traditionally, ambassadors have done a lot of things like going to Linux cons and Linux shows and setting up tables and talking to people about Fedora, which is good, um, and going to you know, Linux users groups and those kind of things. But uh, the impact of that kind of thing is not really gigantic because people uh, people at you know, LinuxCon uh, basically know what Fedora is and a lot of people if you go to a, a like a lin local Linux fest like you will talk to people who are like you know I'm a Linux mint for life person and um, talking the conversation with them like maybe you could persuade them to choose Fedora but it's not really having a gigantic impact on things. So we've been saying for a while at the Fedora Council and leadership levels, we'd like the ambassadors to focus on other things that can maybe bring in new users and focus on um, things that are going to kind of make a difference for the future of Fedora. Uh, and the ambassadors have come back to us and said, OK, that sounds good, but we don't know what specifically that means. So um, I have, um, I called it a modest proposal, but Brian told me I should not refer to eating babies as my suggestion. So I have a, a, a regular proposal that uh, for the basically the future, when we want to spend ambassador money on events, we should pick things that are directly connected to something that's called a Fedora objective. So right now, uh, modularity and this atomic CI thing are two of our objectives. This is part of our Fedora leadership structure in the Fedora Council. That's why I've got the round table picture here. Uh, the Fedora Council has a mix of people like me who are hired to work full time on it and people who are appointed by different committees and people who are elected. And in addition to that, we have these objective leads who are people who have, uh, we select something that is proposed to us as important. Modularity and the atomic CI came to us in this way. And we said, OK, this is something that is important to the future of Fedora. Uh, and that person gets a seat on the council and has, we can basically um, send the message. This is something that came actually from Flock uh, when we were in Prague. There was kind of a, uh, yeah, the Fedora board says we want to do things, but nobody kind of feels like that's an official statement. So we wanted to make sure that like, when we have something that we select as an objective, we empower the people who are working on it to be at the highest you know, levels of Fedora leadership and can kind of have a voice for that kind of thing. So we've got these objectives. Uh, so my proposal, coming back around to what I was talking about five minutes ago, my proposal is 
we should do things for, with ambassadors that directly support those objectives. So when we have something you know, that is automation related, we should go to automation conferences, we should talk to those kind of things, we should talk about uh, when we have, mod we have modularity as an objective and we want to you know, sell that to people who are using slow moving distributions, we should go to where those people are and talk to them. Uh, and then also as part of this, we have um, the Fedora editions. We have a workstation which is aimed at software developers. We've got Fedora Server, we've got Fedora Atomic, this container thing. We should go to the audiences. Each of those has an identified specific audience and some user personas that are identified. We should go to the conferences where those are, people are. We should go to developer conferences rather than Linux conferences and talk to people about why they should use Fedora. So I think that we should uh, focus ambassador money on those kind of things. Um, I would really encourage you to read this post because I put a lot, a lot of time into writing it. Um, we're gonna have a conversation this afternoon about the budget. Um, I will be there um, and I can basically rehash everything I said out loud for people who uh, don't have the attention span for reading, um, which is fine. I, I, sometimes I'm that way as well. Uh, and um, yeah, so I think this is gonna be an important thing for basically Fedora spending in the future. Now I've been talking a lot in a glass of water. Um, here's my basic recap. Uh, we've had a lot of growth, uh, but now things are flattening off. Uh, we really need to live in that innovation space and we need to do the things that make sure that we live there, even if it feels like um, it's uncomfortable. Like we, we, things are going well, why are we lighting on fire? Uh, when things are going well, and then, you know, that's the time we should light a fire because we need to keep living there. If we, if we start feeling like, oh, this is a comfortable, easy thing to be doing, we're not really doing what we, sh we set out to do properly. So, um, yeah, let's light some things on fire. All right, um, I showed dinosaurs for the mirror stats. Um, I have a piece of Swiss cheese here because my next stats are about Fedora contributors, and I've gotten these stats from... Fed message. Fed message is a data bus that uh, basically, uh, when you do certain activities in Fedora, a message goes across this bus and robots or humans can react and do things. If you've gotten Fedora badges ever, most of those badges come from your activity on the Fedora bus. That's how the badges system knows, hey, yeah, this person should be awarded this little uh, virtual bling. So anyways, I've mined this for some contributor stats. So this covers, um, if you've edited the wiki, it's counted here. If you've uh, made a package change, if you've uh, submitted updates, a feedback update in Bodhi, that's counted here. And then also, uh, if you're hanging out on IRC and give somebody a cookie, that's username plus plus, um, I count you as active here. So this is how I kind of counted, this is how people active in Fedora. So I call this Swiss cheese because there's a lot of holes in this. Um, translations aren't counted. Organizing flock isn't counted. All that ambassador effort, um, other than editing wiki pages, isn't really counted. Uh, writing for Fedora Magazine, like just um, so much stuff is not counted in the things I'm about to show. Uh, so here, however, is that graph. Um, so this basically is good data going back to 2015. Uh, and so uh, I, it, there's, there's some noise in here, obviously, but basically this is per week, the number of people who have showed up. And the blue line at the top is people who, anybody who's, anybody whose username I see, regardless of the amount of activity that week. Uh, the people in the Down solid below. colors, I only count if that person has also been seen uh, 13 other weeks throughout the year. So basically, if, you, if for the last year, a quarter of the weeks you've been active, I count it there. So you can see there, um, there's you know, basically froth at the top of people who are dropping in. And some of those people may be actually, you know, Every year they show up and make a big, con big contribution, one, one week. Um, it could, could be that, but a lot of it is kind of drive-by kind of things. Um, but uh, anyways, the red at the bottom, and I didn't actually mean this to look evil, but that's, you know, it's not, it's not bad. That's our old school contributors. Basically, that's people who have been seen um, at that week, they've been active for at least uh, two years before that data point. So you can see that we've got a pretty good consistent base of around 225 people uh, every week who are uh, also showing up throughout the year to work on Fedora. So that's pretty huge. That's a large number of people. And the other thing I think is nice is we can see that the intermediate and the new users, the green is people who have been active, their first active just this year. But again, they've been active for at least 13 weeks in this year. So we can see that even over the past two years, we do have a pretty good influx of new contributors and those new contributors flow into being intermediate contributors and we don't have a trickling away of people. It's not going down. Um, 
there's a lot more data analysis I could do on this, and I probably will in the future. Um, like, you know, how, where do old people go? How long do they stay? That kind of thing. Um, by old people, I, I didn't, didn't mean anything. Dan, Dan Walsh, he was offended last time. Uh, I, yeah, uh, um, I, I'm, I'm counting myself as an old person here, too. Um, I, the dips here, by the way, are Christmas vacation. I think that's awesome. Um, you can, it, it also starts here at the beginning as well. Every, every year, um, you know, Red Hat goes on vacation. Everybody else goes away. Some of the baseline stuff still keeps going. A lot of people are still involved, you know, like 150 people still doing something over Christmas break. But um, there's a clear dip um, when, when it's the holidays there that I think is kind of fun. That's, so that's not a data dinosaur. That's, that's real. Uh, in that job. Um, I would, though, like to see this graph going up as well. I don't think we need exponential growth in the number of contributors. We probably can't handle that. Um, having a solid base is good. But I would like to see a year-over-year -year, you know, upward slant to this. And this is something, again, that ambassadors is something I would like to help work on bringing in new contributors and all of us you know, working, how can we bring new people into Fedora? Um, why is my next slide blank? I don't know. That's awesome. Um, this is actually the end of my presentation, so it's okay that my um, slide is blank. But uh, I had another recap slide here, putting everything together, but I can go back to my other recap. Basically, um, everything is on fire. Yeah, that's probably how things should be. Um, I know it sometimes feels like everything is on fire, not in a good way. Um, we really want to make sure everything is on fire in a good way. Uh, here we are at Flock. This is supposed to be a do session where we try and actually hack on things. This year we're really emphasized actually the actually working rather than just talks. So let's find some of those things that feel like they're on fire in a bad way and figure out how we can make them be on fire in a good way because we don't want um, the fire to you know, cause things to go the wrong direction. We want the fire to be propelling us rocket ship, robot rocket ship like into the future. Uh, so let's figure out where those problems are and make sure we get those solved. Um, and let's figure out what kind of um, awesome automation things we can do to make the next generation of Fedora um, be more awesome and continue growing. And there we are. The next missing slide says, does anybody have any questions? So, uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, we went right to a hardcore technical question. Awesome. Um, yeah, I will repeat it. Um, the question was, uh, so uh, we have got a lot of metadata involved in updates. And that is basically uh, when every time you want to do like DNF update or go to the software center to update um, your system, uh, there's a bunch of stuff in the background, the metadata that, tell, that describes all of the packages and all the app updates available. And that is a gigantic blob of hundreds of megabytes of data. And as Fedora grows, that grows more. As we add modularity, modularity has its own metadata. Um, and it gets to the point where if you have a small container that's maybe, you know, just uh, runs a web server or whatever, um, your metadata for package updates is way bigger than the container itself, like an order of magnitude bigger than the container, and that is ridiculous. Um, that is a good question. I don't know what we're doing about that. That would be something to talk to about the DNF um, team about that because I think we need a solution. A different problem? Okay, different problem. I, I, oh, in my chart, okay, sorry. Not that at all. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so okay, well, let me redo it. Reset, I misunderstood the question, although that is something I'm concerned about as well. Uh, this is basically, um, if people are using containers, now they have on their system like five different containers, each of which is a separate like little kind of mini virtual machine, doesn't that inflate the count? The answer is, since that's coming from the same IP address to the mirrors, it only gets counted once, just like if you do DNF update 17 times on your system, it only gets counted once. So. Um, that's at least smoothed out in there. On the other hand, um, maybe we should count, like, look at this, uh, all this container usage is going up. Um, we're not, 
really me measuring that very well. Smidge. <laughs> right, uh, there's some stuff we can do, uh, we would like to see in DNF to help us um, distinguish between running in a container, running a Fedora workstation, running Fedora server, those kind of things. Um, as a DNF people here, we'll corner them and talk to them about that later. Uh, other questions? Yeah, Mo. Uh, maybe. <laughs> Uh, can I go back to a certain graph? Mo this one, the, this one, yeah, yeah. Uh, fed up, yeah, so um, that was Fedora 21 or something, from 22. Um, so somewhere in the middle of the green, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, so right, we, we have made, Right, we have made the upgrade process go a lot easier recently, which is awesome. And so that definitely contributes to more people being on the most recent releases rather than hanging out on older releases. Yeah, right, so that actually, this, uh, this graph, which has them broken down individually there, yeah, that kind of shows, like, that's why the uptake curve for each one is faster now than they used to be. Um, you might even be able to see that, like, I think the, um, the blue curve here, F21, is before that, and I think F22 is the first one with it. So blue, to, you can see the uptake going more smoothly there. Okay, yeah, right, yeah. Yeah, so um, updates, uh, faster updates are a lot because people have worked and made updates more awesome, so that is good. Uh, and that, so that, yeah, that definitely influences the, how popular each new release is. Um, but again, but the overall total in, um, this graph here, you know, it's a, this is a stacked graph, so um, older releases and new releases all pile on there. Um, right, yeah. Yeah, the theory is that good upgrades make it easier to say, okay, I'll just stay the new, the new Fedora rather than saying, oh, I have to replace this, why don't I replace this with new shiny distro instead of Fedora? So yeah, I agree, the upgrade work has been really valuable in making Fedora more sticky. Uh, other questions? Yeah. A world map of users? Yeah, um, no, we do not have a world map of users. And actually that is another dinosaur in this data um, because this sort of data basically assumes that people are on the internet with reliable connections and checking in every day. And people in a lot of places in the world cannot count on that. So parts of the world which are underrepresented in you know, always on low cost broadband internet are underrepresented in our data, so there may be a lot of Fedora users there that are not very well counted as well. Um, and I, sort of for that same reason, using this to put together a world map of Fedora, it doesn't give a very representative world map. Um, I think we did a little work on that, but it, um, it didn't seem to be showing us very much. So um, we definitely know from you know uh, the people we see and the discussions we have that there are people using Fedora all around the world, but I don't have good numbers on that. Next, Smooch, you have more? Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, you see, I made Fedora 8 be a separate color on this graph. It's the light blue because uh, I, I still, if you go search for Fedora on Amazon EC2, uh, Fedora 8 image still comes up first. So um, that's some some reason there's still some Fedora 8 hanging on, but it's also a, also a mystery. Yeah. So the basic question was, um, if we are, if if our space is this space here. Um, is, is that plateau a natural plateau and the limit of basically what we can achieve? Um, 
I think that the numbers we're seeing are too low for that. I think that um, we've got a we've got a, a much bigger addressable market than we're we're handling basically. Um, Right. So one one issue is we're an operating system innovator, not an applications innovator. Uh, the number of people who care about operating systems for their own sake, um, you know, um, some of the people in this room are in that set, but uh, it is a exclusive club. Uh, right. Yeah, um, right, so it, it does, like we can't grow forever. There's not exponential growth forever. Um, I, I, I do think that the numbers we're seeing right now are, just, are as lower than they could be. Um, yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, so the comment is uh, the way we do Fedora with everything moving quickly with that huge metadata I talked about um, with a lot of high rate of change, um, that basically excludes a lot of people who do have poor internet connectivity. Um, so that's kind of a something that um, we can address and I think that um, again with our, our mission refinement, um, there are definitely uh, room for parts of Fedora, uh, like a Fedora spin or a Fedora, um, a, a version of Fedora, which is more tailored at those kind of things. Um, I think there, there's room for that. Um, I think also uh, some of the stuff we're doing, like batching updates and things like that, are, are going to address that a little bit more. Hopefully some of the modularity stuff will help. Steve? Yeah. Yeah. So the question was basically, is that strategic? Should we care? Um, I'm making that more cruel than it was. But like that's basically the idea. Is this something we should focus on? And I'm gonna go back to my blog post about objectives for this because, again, um, the, the point of the objectives is for us collectively and on the council to talk together about things that we do think are going to advance Fedora and make Fedora grow. And we've got room, basically, by the charter to have between two and four of those. We've got two right now. So there's room for more. And basically, if you are somebody who thinks this is an area where Fedora really could grow, put together that argument, bring it to the council, and we will talk about it and take it seriously. And uh, I know people have been kicking around the idea of university students. We should, you know, maybe that's an area we should grow. Um, the way to do this is to put together an objective proposal, and then that we'll know that that is something that we could focus on. Right, so what about the reverse? If it's not an objective, do we not do it? Um, we sh uh, this is a volunteer community. People are going to do what they want to do and uh, should do what they want to do and do what you're interested in. If there's something you think is important, awesome, you should do that. Um, yeah. yeah. Right, yeah. Right, but I think it's, yeah, so I, I do want to take it to that <laughs> step. If this is something that is you know, in conflict to one of our objectives, if we, you know, if we would say we have an objective over the next 18 months to really make Fedora appeal to low bandwidth users, and somebody has a change which you know, um, destroys Delta RPMs or something like that, um, we, would say, we would prioritize fixing that uh, and say, you know, this is, we, we, can't, we can't do that right now. This is the objective we're focusing on. 
Uh, and again, this is what I was saying with the spending. Um, if it is something that we've identified as an objective, we should spend money on it. If it's not something we've identified as an objective, when we go to you know, do the ambassador budget and things, we should say, OK, that sounds important, but we don't have money for that right now because we're focusing on these other things. So yeah, it does mean um, if focus naturally means there are things that are outside of the focus which um, don't get uh, things that they want. Yeah, Mo. OK, more statistics questions. Yeah, so the question is, uh, we don't have, a, I didn't do a breakdown of Fedora editions and spins and those kind of things. Do I have an idea of that? Um, we do not have a super good idea of that, again, because the metadata, like the data we get doesn't distinguish between those kind of things. We have a long-standing request for DNF to include some basic information like that, which would make it very helpful. Um, I think that um, the, the best we have is kind of interest in the download pages, the web pages, like which part you know, people look at um, you know, the, the get workstation versus get server kind of things. And I, um, from that, I kind of get the sense that it's somewhere around 80% desktop um, and 20% server and atomic um, with uh, the Fedora workstation, GNOME spin being the lion's share and um, the other spins being somewhere around 10%. But I, uh, again, we don't really have solid numbers on that, so that's. Right, yeah, so, right, and that's, yeah, and some of the stuff, um, like, I, you know, I know that a very large company is using Atomic for something in production that is pretty awesome, and they've got a large-scale deployment of it, um, and that doesn't show up in our numbers for Atomic at all, which seem to be very low. Um, so some of the stuff doesn't get counted very well. So, yeah, um, I wish I knew more, but I don't. Uh, more questions? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, yes there are. It wasn't really a question. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of people, the question is, a lot of people are on old releases. Um, what should we do about that? Um, I don't know. Uh, I try and gently encourage people to upgrade. I think the work we put into making upgrades easy in GNOME software, fed up, the DNF system upgrades really help because it's not such a scary thing to upgrade. Uh, and actually, um, I don't have it charted here, but if you look at um, current releases over time, uh, more and more people are on the newer releases. So actually, uh, right now, a majority of people are on supported releases, and that wasn't the case, say, four years ago. Four years ago, a majority of Fedora users were on old releases, um, which is kind of a sad state. But now, it's not just a majority, it's a pretty solid majority. Uh, but yeah, um, it'd be nice to do more about that, but I don't know what more we can do other than making upgrades easier. Um, Yeah, right. Um, I, we, we did, um, th there is a package which isn't, isn't there anymore, um, but we had a while called System Auto DAF, which would disconnect your system from the network after the release was not, no longer supported, that um, actually uh, wrote for use at universities because we had a lot of people installing systems and then never updating them and then there were security problems later. Um, I stopped maintaining that because I kept getting uh, angry people saying, I installed your package and now my system doesn't work. Um, <laughs> and I said, well, I, <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's probably not the best general approach. Uh, anything else? Um, okay, so uh, we're going to do a little bit of a break. Do you want to come back up and do logistics talk stuff, Brian? I'll 15 minutes for everybody in this room to go to the bathroom. Yeah.